I guess that's going to still be there. Right? Okay. Well, good noon, everybody, um, both in person and online, and uh, welcome to another UAB Pathology Grand Rounds. Um, I hope you all agree that we started off with a great first speaker, and I have no doubt that today's speaker will continue this trend. Um, that being said, today it's my pleasure to introduce. Um, yes, can you meet that yeah. nice? <laughs> Thank you. It's hidden. Okay, sorry, there's a little bit of feedback. Um, so today it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Christopher. Genschmer, an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine in the Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Department. Um, Dr. Genschmer started his studies at the University of Florida before making his way up to Birmingham, where he completed his PhD and then liked it so much he stayed on as a postdoc. And we we're fortunate enough to hire him on as faculty in 2018 as an assistant professor. Um, he currently holds a funded Cystic Fibrosis Award and a newly funded NIHR01. Congratulations. And with these efforts, he's published 14 manuscripts in the literature. His work focuses on uh, several different areas, including exosomes, surface proteoglycans, and um, how some of those impact several different diseases, of which today he's going to tell us about the role of proteolytic extracellular vesicles from neutrophils and COPD disease pathogenesis. Dr. Genshin. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually University of Central Florida, um, where the knights, not the gators. But uh, yeah, we're big. We're a bigger school than uh, Florida, so it's, we're actually I think second biggest in the country. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking today about the role of proteolytic extracellular vesicles from neutrophils in COPD disease pathogenesis. Um, I have no conflicts of interest or anything with this study, so I'll get that out uh, of that. And I will. Uh, I'll make sure to try to go in as much depth without going overboard on what extracellular vesicles are, because I'm not sure how many of you even heard about what an extracellular vesicle is. So I know I didn't when I started my studies here um, in my postdoc. So um, the objectives, I can forward the slide. Nothing is moving. There we go. Technology. All right. Objective for today, I'm a little beefy, but they're not as difficult as they sound here. I'm going to go through and I'm going to try to identify and characterize what these proteolytic extracellular vesicles are, specifically the ones that we've derived from neutrophils in this, in this uh, disease phenotype. Um, we're going to examine uh, the presence and function of these pathogenic EVs from actual COPD patient bronchoalveolar lavage fluid and how they function in a mouse model of emphysema. Um, and uh, the, the final objective and, and, and pretty much the, the biggest part of this talk will be the development and utilization of this new mouse model that we've got. It's called the smoking mouse model to further examine pathogenic and proteolytic neutrophil derived extracellular vesicles. Before I go into what EVs are, um, I'll just go a quick, uh, quick overview of what some uh, uh, of COPD um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what, what I studied, it's our lab in our group, we study a lot of COPD among other inflammatory lung diseases, but um, and these are some, a little bit older statistics, the pandemic kind of skewed uh, some of these statistics as to the leading cause of death in the US, but pre-pandemic, uh, COPD was fourth, some, depending on literature, sometimes third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, as you can see from this map here, um, and this map is from 2019, it's the age standardized death rate per 100,000 US citizens, uh, we are smack dab in the center of um, basically emphysema and COPD alley, I guess you could call it. Um, in Alabama and, and a lot of the South, it, it hits about 50 to 60 people per 100,000 are succumbing to COPD every year. So it's a major health burden, um, both uh, financially and just quality of life when it comes to how many people are, are suffering from COPD. And smoking is leading cause of COPD in the United States. Um, I'm going to briefly go over what our model is um, for this chronic inflammation that you see in, in COPD and kind of like what we think is occurring to, to, to sort of propagate this. I mean, this is actually adapted from a science paper that Rob Snellgrove in our group had done back in 2010. Um, typically, what we, what we have is our initiation phase of, of, of 
inflammation. So some sort of, um, whether it's an injury, whether it's an infection, something's going to cause this initiation of inflammation. And you're going to see that you're going to have your alveolar macrophages will be, come to the side of the, of the uh, inflammation. IL-8 will be released to recruit more neutrophils. Um, and I guess my pointer will be here. Yeah. And so um, with these, you've got uh, the neutrophils can then create their own sort of neutrophil chemotractant with their, this enzyme called LTA4 hydrolase, um, trying A4 hydrolase, that basically converts LTA4 to LTB4, and LTB4 is another chemotractant. So these neutrophils are self-propagating their, um, their migration towards the site of inflammation. The propagation phase is where we get a little bit interesting here. Um, these neutrophils that are in the site are going to be degranulating. They're going to be activating. They're going to be releasing a lot of these active proteases into the uh, into the area. Um, one of which is going to be a matrix metalloproteases, specifically MMP9. MMP9's function is going to be to degrade and break down some of the collagen that you see in the extracellular matrix. This is going to be what sort of facilitates this um, alveolar destruction, alveolar enlargement, typically what you'd see in an emphysema. But what's interesting and what was uh, discovered in our group a, a few years back is that there's another enzyme called prolyl endopeptidase, and that's PE. And what that does is it breaks down these smaller fragments of extracellular matrix that you see being cleaved off by MMP9, and it, it breaks down between two proline residues that are side by side to generate this tripeptide called PGP, proline glycine proline. This tripeptide actually acts as another neutrophil chemotractant, very similar in function to IL-8. So neutrophils can once again, in a, in a second round, repotentiate and propagate their, um, their migration to the site of infection with this, this PGP or the site of injury or insult to the lung. Typically, LTA4 hydrolase, this is actually where this paper, Rob's paper had come from. L he had discovered that LTA4 hydrolase has a second action. And that action is to break down PGP um, to a proline and a glycine proline residue so that you, uh, you no longer have this chemotractant PGP that's propagating more neutrophils to the side of inflammation. And this paper had also discovered that cigarette smoke or smoking can actually impair this property of LTA4 hydrolase, thereby perpetuating a, a, almost a feed forward loop of PGP bringing in more of these neutrophils. <laughs> The, in, the interesting issue here was we weren't necessarily sure where this proline endopeptidase was coming from. Um, but we wanted to see, uh, since we saw that PGP um, is generated and can cause neutrophils to come to the side of infection or inflammation, and that cigarette smoke um, also is going to be a, a causative effect of COPD or emphysema, we wanted to develop sort of, uh, look at these in mice. And these were both done by Mike Wells, who's still here at UAB in the pulmonary division back in 2010, and also Nate Weathington, who was an MD, PhD student back in 2006. So um, in, in the, the left-hand panel, what you see is uh, the effects of cigarette smoke on a, in a mouse model. These mice are being smoked for a uh, various length of time. Their um, lung sections are being uh, looked at. And what you see here is you see the, the uh, alveolar enlargement, the, the uh, increasing size of alveoli. And um, the way that we typically will measure this, you'll see these types of graphs throughout this talk, is we measure the mean linear intercept. And basically what that is, is it's uh, for a given length, how many, um, how many sort of septum that you're crossing, the larger the airways, the fewer septum you're gonna cross for a given length. So that increases the mean linear intercept. So typically you will see this, this distinction here between um, higher uh, LMs indicating larger alveoli, more damage, whereas your control would have um, lower LMs. So with cigarette smoke, as expected, you would see damage to the mouse lungs, um, including uh, down here, you see this, this is the Fulton index. This is an indication of right ventricular hypertrophy. So the enlargement of the right ventricle, which is another hallmark telltale sign of emphysema and COPD. The interesting part over here is with the PGP, which is that tripeptide that was generated to cause neutrophils to a to the side of infection, just giving PGP into the mice also caused this same sort of uh, phenotype. So you're, you're artificially generating in, adding PGP, neutrophils are coming to the site of this um, inflammatory response, and it's causing alveolar enlargement. You're seeing an increase in the LM. You're also seeing this increase in uh, the, the Fulton index, which is an in indication of right ventricular hypertrophy. 
So that goes back to our list here. The, uh, our, our, our guide here is this proto underpethidase, however, wasn't, isn't necessarily coming from these neutrophils. It wasn't sure at this time point when we were looking at this where this proto underpethidase was coming from. So another individual in the lab, uh, Tomas Schul, had discovered this, this is where our, our foray into extracellular vesicles and exosomes actually started. Um, is he discovered that uh, with a TLR4 engagement in um, airway epithelial cells, they release these small 100 nanometer sized particles called exosomes. And these exosomes that he was looking at is what contained this prolo endopeptidase. So this is where it was located in these tiny um, particles called exosomes. Um, and this, this is just a, a, an excerpt from his, his paper showing that um, anywhere that you see these red dots where prolo endopeptidase is um, indicated, it also co-localizes with an exosome specific marker without going into too much detail, CD63, CD81, and Alex. Those are all prototypical markers indicating uh, exosomes. And they, uh, they all co-localize within this. So this is the first time we pretty much discovered that you can have an active enzyme in these exosomes. Up to this point, most people thought of extracellular vesicles and exosomes as um, sort of like waste disposal units for cells to be able to shuttle out um, uh, any sort of cellular waste or even to be able to signal to cells with microRNAs and things further downstream. So what is an extracellular vesicle? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> there's, there, I, I had never heard of these until I started doing my uh, postdoc in uh, the Blaylock lab in pulmonary. Um, there are, depending on where you read uh, what an EV is and what time frame you're looking at these papers, you're going to get slightly different um, descriptions because this is still an evolving uh, sort of area of science. So, but there are basically um, three types of extracellular vesicles. This is the, the smallest ones, which are exosomes, um, which range between 50 and 150 nanometers in size. Very, very small. Um, in some places, they'll even record them as high as 300 but I put that in quotations because um, that's not necessarily the accepted size for exosomes. But they are generated very specifically. And the, the one hallmark of an exosome is its generation, is it, it, it begins as an endocytosis event in the cell. Um, it makes these early endosomes and through a lot of complicated processes, eventually turns into these multivesicular bodies, MVBs. These exosomes are all within these MVBs until a signal causes them to be released. And that's about as far into depth as I'm going to go with these exosomes and their process. But just know that it's, it's a coordinated event for these exosomes to go through and be released. And these exosomes, are, they're generated by most, if not all, cell types. They can have microRNAs. They can have various proteins, cytosolic proteins um, within them. And they can travel very far within the body. They're very, very stable within... Um, within the, the body and also within tissue and um, extracellular matrix and things like that. The microvesicles, however, is another larger uh, category of these extracellular vesicles. Those are typically what are considered to, be, to bud off of the plasma membranes. Um, you can see them down here in this image here. They tend to be slightly larger between 300 nanometers and, and one micron. Um, and typically they will have more of the cellular uh, surface markers and some of the cytosolic proteins that you would find since they are typically literally budding off of the, um, the cell itself. And then the third major type is apoptotic bodies. And that's just what they sound like. When a cell undergoes apoptosis, you see these 500 to two micron sized particles. And uh, they basically will have uh, nuclear fractions, cell organelles, things of that nature. One final thing to get into uh, with these is this thing called, it's a, it's a new term that was coined and, and we actually got, uh, were part of why they termed it this. It's a called a, uh, an exosome corona or an extracellular vesicle corona. And that's just this sort of halo um, around the EV where uh, proteins and enzymes can actually bind to the EV uh, extracellular. They're not packaged with the extracellular vesicle. They're actually something that they pick up after the extracellular vesicle is released. Um, and you, as you'll see in this talk, neutrophil elastase is one of the things that we have identified to be in this corona. So throughout my talk, you may hear me say extracellular vesicles and exosomes interchangeably. And the reason for that is uh, the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles has a very strict and specific criterion you must go through to consider something an exosome. So I'll be, um, I'll, I'll be referring to them as EVs or exosomes as they go through. But um, what's more specific is actually how we isolate them. And from how we isolate these, you can sort of make your own determination. But we go through a protocol of, of differential ultracentrifugation. 
um, basically removing larger and larger particles until we pellet down what we're looking for. Uh, so we do a 2000 G spin to remove debris, 10,000 G spin then would remove those large micro vesicles and apoptotic bodies. And then a final 150,000 G spin will actually pellet these small 50 to 150 nanometer um, exosomes that we that we collect. And uh, we then uh, visualize and count them with something called nano tracking analysis. And this is a sample graph of what you would see. You'd see basically a particle size and, and concentration to sort of verify what it is that we've purified and, and are seeing because they're very, very small and we can't see them without an electron microscope. So the question is, a proloendopeptidase from airway epithelial derived extracellular vesicles, what role do neutrophil derived EVs play in this COPD phenotype? And the answer to that is that it uh, appears that when an activated a neutrophil gets activated and degranulates, neutrophil elastase will bind back to the surface and it's active. So we, what we did is we took uh, neutrophils from peripheral blood, human neutrophils from peripheral blood, isolated them, and then either left them quiescent for 30 minutes or we stimulated them with a, a, a neutrophil stimulator to cause them to degranulate. We then looked at them, we counted them and looked at them under electron micrograph. We see no visual differences between the populations. But what we did notice was that when we stained for surface neutrophil elastase um, with a fluorescent antibody, we noticed that we get a much larger peak on what we term the activated population. So this neutrophil elastase that is being released from the neutrophils during the granulation is binding back to the surface of these extracellular vesicles. And if you were to add a substrate to a colorimetric substrate to these EVs, you'll see that they're also proteolytically active. They will cleave the neutrophil elastase substrate, um, indicating that these EVs are now sort of like their little Pac-Man running around trying to be able to dissolve any sort of elastase substrate they come in contact with. We then wanted to look at these fibrils. Uh, these are collagen fibers here that we looked under an electron microscope. In panels B and C, you see quiescent and activated uh, EVs that are being um, incubated with the uh, collagen. They sort of line up along the collagen fibrils. If you uh, go 24 hours, you'll notice that in panel D, these are the quiescent EVs along this collagen fibril. The activated EVs completely begin to chew up and degrade this collagen. And this is what we are, um, are uh, observing that we see within uh, uh, the mouse of the extracellular matrix. This is how these EVs are degrading this. In panel F, it's just a, a blown up shot of an EV next to this collagen. You can begin to see right near it where the degradation is occurring. The interesting part about this neutrophil elastase on the surface of these EVs is it is resistant to the endogenous inhibitor alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha 1 antitrypsin in our bodies, what keeps our neutrophil elastase from being constantly active, actually during a degranulation event, the majority of the neutrophil elastase that is being degranulated is bound up by alpha 1 antitrypsin and is made inactive. If it's on the surface of one of these extracellular vesicles, the alpha 1 antitrypsin cannot bind to it to cause it to be inactivated. So basically on this left-hand side, what we're seeing here is we're seeing uh, 20 nanograms of, of purified neutrophil elastase and showing that down here, both an active site inhibitor and the inhibitor two, as well as alpha-1 antitrypsin, will cause it to be completely inhibited. However, in the second panel, we see that red line, that is the equivalent amount of <laughs> neutrophil elastase on an exosome compared to this amount that the, of the purified any. And both the um, alpha-1 antitrypsin and any inhibitor have a decreased amount of uh, inhibition when it's bound to the um, EV. So this is basically sort of tipping the scales of this protease antiprotease balance that you would have in COPD or any disease, basically, because you, instead of you um, changing the uh, quantities of the inhibitor or the uh, like decreasing the amount of inhibitor, you're just decreasing the accessibility the inhibitor has to the active enzyme. So what would happen if we put these into our mouse model, put them into, into the lungs of mice? What you would see, it is a, a mouse that's given uh, one, these are one times 10 to the eight EVs in this example here, PBS or one times 10 to the eight quiescent EVs given into a mouse after one week. So no difference in alveolar enlargement. However, they completely begin to chew up the alveoli and the extracellular matrix in the, um, the mouse uh, when they are activated, when they have active neutrophil elastase in them. Uh, and so these analyses that we do also on here is we can see our LM again that we do, our typical, this is our mean linear intercept, the visual or the graphical representation of that. 
Um, we did a pulmonary function test to sort of look at the airway resistance. And as you can see here in the group of mice that got the uh, activated uh, neutrophil extracellular vesicles, you had this increase in airway resistance, which is a hallmark of the emphysema COPD phenotype, as well as an increase in the Fulton index, indicating that you're developing right ventricular hypertrophy. And again, this is after seven days of a one-time dose of these EVs into this mouse. Um, all right. Our hypothesis is that this neutrophil elastase is binding back to the surface of these EVs through ionic interactions with proteoglycans. This is what happens on the surface of neutrophils. And since these extracellular vesicles are coming from neutrophils, it's assumed that they're going to have similar proteoglycan signature. So what we did with these two panels are we wanted to look at this hypothesis. And in the left, we wanted to see if we took quiescent EVs with no NE, and we incubated them with purified NE, could we theoretically turn a quiescent into an activated phenotype? And in fact, we could. If we were to incubate neutrophil elastase purified with these quiescent EVs and then filter through any NE that was unbound, you notice that the only group that had activity are with the, the quiescent EVs and the neutrophils were co-incubated. NE by itself filtered through. The quiescent EVs by themselves had no activity. This is an NE degradation assay. Conversely, if activated uh, EVs, if the neutrophil elastase is bound to the surface proteoglycan through ionic interactions, we should be able to manipulate these ionic interactions to cause the neutrophil elastase to come off the surface. And in fact, uh, we did that with, going back, here we are, um, protamine sulfate. Now, protamine sulfate is a, uh, it's a, a, it's a charged uh, um, molecule that will interact with the neutrophil elastase, displacing it from these proteoglycans, because we believe that it's heparin sulfate or and chondroitin sulfate that are the, the binding site. <laughs> so in this far right panel, what you would see is activated exosomes uh, with and without alpha-1 antitrypsin, noticing that there's no difference in the activity. There's also activated exosomes with protamine sulfate, now, the protamine sulfate by itself, even if it's cleaving the neutrophil elastase from the surface of the EV, doesn't affect the activity. However, down below in the teal, if we were to incubate these activated exosomes with protamine sulfate and alpha-1 antitrypsin, we then lose all activity, indicating that the protamine sulfate removes this enzyme from the surface of the EV, and it is now possible to be inhibited by the endogenous inhibitor alpha-1 antitrypsin. So these aren't covalent uh, bonds. This does sort of um, go with our model that uh, once these neutrophils are degranulating, the elastase that is being degranulated is binding back to the surface of these extracellular vesicles. And there we are. All right, so this brings me to our, this is our, uh, our model. So this is our neutrophil up in panel A, and you see the little yellow balls of the EVs. They're being released constitutively, whether this is a quiescent uh, neutrophil up there. In the panel B, some stimulus is causing the neutrophil to degranulate. In blue are the uh, neutrophil elastase as part of the granules that are coming out into the, the milieu around. Um, the uh, little Pac-Man blue here, the neutrophil elastases can then bind to nearby EVs if there are some that are, are nearby. However, with these little boomerangs, which are alpha-1 antitrypsin, any unbound NE to the surface of an EV can still be inhibited by the alpha-1 antitrypsin. But all of the neutrophil elastase that's on the surface is proteolytically active. If we were to disrupt that charge interaction, releasing the neutrophil elastase from the surface, then the alpha-1 antitrypsin can then come and completely inhibit the activity. So that's the conclusion from this first part, basically our in vitro analysis of these uh, neutrophil-derived EVs. Um, neutrophils produce extracellular vesicles that can bind neutrophil elastase from degranulation events onto the surface. This neutrophil elastase, importantly, is alpha-1 antitrypsin resistant, which, which completely uh, offputs that uh, protease, antiprotease balance. The neutrophil elastase is associated via charge interactions. And these neutrophil-derived EVs are pathogenic when they're given into naive mouse um, in a mouse lung, in a model. So if COPD is a chronic inflammatory disease, can we detect these pathogenic neutrophil-derived EVs in COPD patients if we were to analyze the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid? The answer to that is yes, we can. 
We took Cumin's uh, uh, Bronco Vito on Vox fluid. We also had some non-smoker controls. So what you're seeing right here are EVs isolated from never smoker controls. These are human valves added to mice and uh, alongside um, mice that received only PBS. But when we isolated the EVs from C uh, COPD patients and delivered those to the mice, you notice that you get this, this uh, alveolar enlargement, this destruction of the airways, similar to what we did when we saw purified neutrophil derived EVs that were activated into the mouse lung. We wanted to show these are a heterogeneous mixture of, of EVs because these EVs in a valve can come from uh, epithelial cells, they can come from macrophages, monocytes, a lot of different cell types. So we wanted to show and verify that these actually came from neutrophils. Um, and in order to do that, we used a, I uh, can't really read it here, but we used a CD66B uh, antibody, which actually is a, it's a neutrophil marker, CD66B. So we would bind these EVs and release them. So in this middle panel here, only EVs that came from neutrophils that were in the lungs of these patients were delivered to these mice. And that is where you see the damage. Also, neutrophil elastase inhibitor pre-incubated with these EVs caused the damage to disappear. This is, the small, this is a small molecule um, uh, inhibitor, not alpha-1 antitrypsin. And the same occurred if we were to inhibit the... Um, the EVs that came only from neutrophils within these patient samples. So COPD patients, whether they smoke or they've uh, quit smoking, have active proteolytic pathogenic extracellular vesicles within their lungs that can transfer disease to these mice. So we wanted to look even further and look at what role cigarette smoke plays in the pathogenicity of these um, EVs. Um, if you remember from the earlier on, we showed that mice that are uh, exposed to cigarette smoke develop these um, pathogenic or, or, or show that they've got uh, lung degradation. So theoretically, cigarette smoke sh should be able to cause the production of these EVs by themselves outside of having a COPD disease phenotype to be able to pass on this, um, this, these proteolytic EVs. So what we did is we took neutrophils um, and we stimulated them this time with cigarette smoke extracts, or we left them quiescent. Um, the top panel here, you just sort of see uh, that we get the relative size and shape of these are similar based with our nano tracking analysis. Um, but down the bottom left, you'll notice that EVs that were come from neutrophils activated with cigarette smoke extract react just the same way as they did when we gave them their degranulating activation factor. You see an increase in the mean linear intercept indicating alveolar destruction. You also see an increase in the Fulton index indicating right ventricular hypertrophy. So cigarette smoke can stimulate these neutrophils to create these same extracellular vesicles. Interestingly, and you can't read this, I'll, I'll explain this with the, the base. These are patients that don't have COPD. These are patients who are smokers, former smokers or never smokers. And they're compared to um, this range of what mice that just received PBS. The extracellular vesicles from the bronchovelar lavage fluid of current active smokers without COPD would, given to mice, would cause alveolar enlargement, would cause these, um, this lung degradation, these LM, this increase in the mean linear intercept of the alveoli. Quitting smoking, and these former smokers in this middle panel here had quit smoking for at least one year of smoking cessation. There's still a residual effect that you see of the extracellular vesicles within these lungs. Now, some of these are overlapping with our never, our never smoke control. So it's possible that some of these former smoker um, EVs in their lungs have returned back to a basal level of activity. However, there are still um, an increased amount of activity even after smoking cessation for, for at least a year. So the only thing that we've added to this within the, this last experiment, all these experiments in the last five years that we've done to this model is added neutrophil elastase up into this, which is probably, in my opinion, one of the more important uh, proteases in this entire phenomenon. So the conclusion to that second part, uh, extracellular <laughs> vesicles isolated from COPD patient valves um, can confer emphysema-like phenotype to naive mice. These EVs that are from these neutrophils, meaning they're cd 66 b positive, they're the primary drivers of this, um, this sort of uh, emphysema-like phenotype uh, in the mice. Cigarette smoke extract can stimulate these neutrophils to produce these pathogenic EVs, and extracellular vesicles from the bowel of current smokers without COPD can produce alveolar enlargement in these naive mouse lungs.
And even through smoking cessation, um, your, the EVs may still be proteolytic in their um, capabilities to deliver. So in order to continue to study and evaluate these EVs, we need mouse models. Um, it's nice to be able to look in human samples, but you can only get so many and it's pricey, expensive to process. Plus it's very, uh, it's very invasive to the, to the patients to have to get bronchoveal, all the Bosch fluids um, in order to test these. So we wanna make a mouse to mouse transfer model. The first thing we have to do is we got to be able to uh, sort of get this neutrophil influx that we are looking for without having to go into this long two, three, six month smoking model that we, we eventually want to move this into. So LPS is what we wanted to look at first. Um, we wanted to uh, instill LPS into these into the mice for a 24 hour period and then harvest the extracellular vesicles from the bronchial via the box fluid. In the right-hand panel, you see a uh, immune cell ratio percentages here. We wanted to verify that the LPS is actually causing us to have this neutrophil influx. So with the saline controls, which you see on the, in the gray, um, the predominantly macrophages were what were in the bowel, whereas at 24 hours after LPS installation, you get this massive percent uh, shift into a uh, neutrophil um, phenotype of the immune cells in the lung. <laughs> Looking at these EVs that we get, uh, similarly to what we saw before, uh, EVs from the saline treated mice have uh, far fewer surface neutrophil elastase on them than the EVs that came from uh, mice treated with LPS. That's indicated in the upper right hand panel. You see a, this is flow cytometry. You see a flow shift in the uh, fluorescent antibodies that indicate more neutrophil elastase on the surface. This neutrophil elastase is proteolytically active as well as alpha-1 antitrypsin resistant. So in the far left panel, you see uh, antibodies from, or um, EVs from mice treated with LPS and the amount of uh, neutrophil elastase activity versus those mice treated with just saline. And the far right-hand side, you'll see that, that uh, any activity can be inhibited with the active side inhibitor, but not alpha-1 antitrypsin as indicated by the middle graph or as you can see, the top two bars are LPS and LPS with alpha-1 antitrypsin. If we were to remove all of the neutrophil-derived EVs, which in mice, they don't have CD66B, but they do have Ly6Gs for the neutrophils, we drop down this activity because the majority of the activity is due to neutrophil-derived EVs. And of course, and I should say of course, but interestingly, and as what you would think, Elaine is our any knockout mouse, which now we can, in mice models, we can use knockout mice. If you were to give LPS to an any knockout mouse, your EVs have no neutrophil elastase activity. Good. <laughs> um, so we wanted to look at these. Now we want to take these EVs we got from these LPS treated mice and then put them into naive mice. Can we do a mouse to mouse transfer of this phenotype? We use two different uh, strains of mice. That's what each of these are. On the left hand side, it's the AJ mice, which are our typical emphysema and COPD. Um, mouse model because they're more um, susceptible to the, the emphysema model. However, most of our mutants are done in black six mice, which is why we tested them over to the right. These are increasing amounts of EVs that we get. We gave, we wanted to see where do we have to, how many extracellular vesicles would we have to give to see this phenotype? And in both instances, 10 to the seventh and 10 to the eighth uh, EVs in each mouse model was enough to give us visualization of increased alveolar enlargement from the LPS treated mouse group. So we were able to recapitulate and show that it from a mouse that was given, a had a massive inflammation, neutrophil um, influx into their lungs, EVs taken from those mice could then confer this alveolar enlargement to naive mice. However, when we did pulmonary function tests, it should be noted that this is only a one week exposure period. So when we did pulmonary function tests, only mice that received the 10 to the eighth amount of EVs showed uh, enough of a alveolar degradation to change their pulmonary function test. So we decided that uh, 10 to the eighth is the number that we're gonna go with. So you have an increased airway resistance with 10 to the eighth exosomes. You have a decrease in the forced expiratory volume at 0.1 uh, seconds, which is another uh, indication of decreased pulmonary function as well as your Fulton index, which is an indication of uh, the development of right ventricular hypertrophy. 
So as uh, these are more of visualization here. So uh, the mice that received LPS extracellular vesicles, you can see this increase in LVR enlargement versus those that received saline. There's the, uh, the mean linear intercept measurements are over to the right. Uh, if you were to inhibit the extracellular vesicles, again, with an active site neutrophil elastase inhibitor, you decrease this uh, alveolar enlargement due to the EVs. And uh, if you were to remove all the EVs from neutrophils, once again, you remove this phenotype, indicating it's neutrophil elastase uh, driven, and it's from EVs that derive from neutrophils in these mice. And just as uh, check our knockouts, uh, on the, uh, um, any knockout mice do not produce EVs with active neutrophil elastase, which is a good thing. Uh, in the left-hand side, the wild-type mice, these are what we'd expect, mice that received um, LPS EVs from wild-type mice show alveolar enlargement, whereas those that receive saline do not. Um, mice that received uh, EVs from any knockout mice treated with LPS do not show an increase in alveolar enlargement, and that is shown graphically to the right. So now that we know that we can transfer pathogenic EVs from LPS-treated mice to naive mice, and we can get alveolar enlargement, can we use this information to finally develop a smoking mouse model, a model in which we can have mice smoking and see if we can then recapitulate what we see in patients who smoke in mice that smoke. So the first thing we had to do is look at uh, our exposure time. So we smoke <laughs> mice in a smoking chamber. They get, uh, they get smoked five days a week. Um, uh, they're exposed to cigarette smoke. And we did it over various time points. We did one week, two weeks, one month, three months, and six months. Here, shown here is two weeks to six months plus our saline control. And as you can see, the longer they're exposed to the cigarette smoke, the more damage that they're getting um, in their, uh, that their EVs are, are able to produce when given to another mouse. These are all controlled with the air exposed um, <clears throat> control. So each of these groups had a corresponding group of mice that was uh, only exposed to air for that given time. These are the EVs removed from these groups and given to naive mice. So even as, as quickly as two weeks, naive mice that received the EVs from, from uh, mice smoke for two weeks begin to see alveolar enlargement and um, uh, airway Im impediments. These are just visual representations of what, what I showed before. You can see, especially at the, once you get the one month time point on, you can see the alveolar enlargement. Mm -hmm. Now, just, to, just for a reminder, the only thing that these are, these are all mice that received extracellular vesicles from a group of mice that, was, that had been smoking out of their alveolar or bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. <clears throat> and this is where it gets interesting. So when we do LPS in our LPS model, we know that the vast majority of the cells that are, come to the lungs after 24 hours of LPS treatment are neutrophils. During prolonged smoke exposure, it's not just neutrophil oriented anymore when it comes to the immune cells. We now are gonna to begin to see uh, other players like macrophages and such that are going to play along with these in the, in the extracellular vesicles. And we see this in this graph here. So what, what happened here, at least is a three month time point. Um, wild type mice that were smoked for three months, their extracellular vesicles removed, given to naive mice versus their air uh, control. You see the, what we would expect this difference in alveolar enlargement. You get a much larger alveolar destruction um, versus the control. However, in any knockout mice that we smoke for three months without neutrophil elastase, there's no, no uh, way that they can have neutrophil elastase on their neutrophils, those EVs from their bronca alveolar lavage fluid still have a small amount, some modicum of alveolar degradation that we saw in these mice. And this is where we uh, then began to start looking at macrophages and macrophage derived EVs and some of the matrix metalloproteases that may be involved in this, but that's a story for another time. So conclusions for part three, um, LPS treated mice produce these neutrophil elastase positive extracellular vesicles. These extracellular vesicles are pathogenic to naive mice. Uh, the extracellular vesicles from LPS treated, not any knockout mice lack this phenotype. So in LPS, everything that we've seen in vitro holds true. But when mice begin to get exposed to cigarette smoke, uh, they still develop pathogenic uh, extracellular vesicles and their neutrophil elastase uh, are, is active. Uh, these EVs can also transfer disease phenotype to naive mice. 
But when you knock out Legion to the last days, you do notice that there is some other player, uh, potentially MMP12, might be macrophage drive EVs. Um, and it would make sense because this is a prolonged exposure. This isn't something that happens um, in a short period of time to where neutrophils would be the only player. But this did, does give us the, the uh, a mouse to mouse transfer model that we can use to study other things in this pathway. We've got other mice that we can knock out genes from to examine each individual player along the way um, to see what's going to co more cause and effect. Um, some of the future studies that we've got planned, and uh, I do have some time, I can show, uh, I'll show one more um, couple slides after this, but protamine sulfate is the molecule I showed you that can remove neutrophil elastase from the surface of these EVs and allow alpha-1 antitrypsin to inhibit it. Can we use this as some sort of therapeutic, some sort of uh, ability to uh, minimize the damage that these EVs are causing in vitro? And a good way to do this now that we have a smoking mouse model if we were to give, along with cigarette smoke in these mice, if we were to instill protamine sulfate into their lungs, do we see this decrease in this pathogenicity? Um, we're going to evaluate the extracellular vesicles from other immune cells, from macrophages. This is, this is all being done. Um, and their contribution to this emphysema model, looking at various matrix metalloproteases that could be associated with those extracellular vesicles. Um, and uh, a big part of, of my grant now is... Can these EVs from non-COPD patients predict future COPD diagnoses when they're taken longitudinally? So we noticed that with those never there are those former smokers, we still had sort of a range of pathogenicity within their extracellular vesicle population. This is a snapshot in time. We know that only a certain percentage of people who smoke are ever going to develop COPD. Um, and we also know that some people who quit smoking that aren't diagnosed with COPD eventually down the road, even if they never smoke again, can still develop COPD. Is there a way that longitudinally we'll begin to see almost like a biphasic sort of response with these EVs in these patients? Do some of them constantly retain this proteolytic capability? And will those people eventually progress <coughs> to develop COPD? And if that's the case, is it possible for us to be able to arrest the activity of those neutrophilolastase derived EVs and prevent that further um, pathogenicity of them. And uh, also looking at uh, uh, extracellular vesicle derived EVs and other inflammatory lung diseases. And this is also being done cystic fibrosis, acute respiratory distress syndrome, IPF, um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, since the, these, a lot of these diseases are characterized by uh, uh, high neutrophil inflammation, the EVs, what are the effect that these EVs have on these disease phenotypes <laughs> as well? Um, I'd like to acknowledge my group, um, of my mentor, uh, Ed Blaylock. He uh, started this whole project while doing a rotation, or um, my postdoc with him, Amit Gagar, uh, was also part of our group in there. Derek Russell, who was my um, co-first author uh, partner on our cell paper that we had describing these EVs. Uh, Camilla and Matthew, who were the, uh, basically did the LPS and smoke mouse models for our group, and then Lip Lily for uh, all the mouse work. This is our funding, all through the grants that are called most of the funding for all this stuff that you've seen here. I do have a quick second here, uh, this is a little quick, I'd like to show you. This is something that kind of puts into perspective all of the patients, and this is a, this is a, 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 a work in progress here. Each of these dots, by the way, are single patients. Um, you can see the, the sort of contribution of patient EVs from their bowels. Uh, starting from these COPD patients who are still smoking all the way down to the never smokers. Um, what I found interesting was stopping, if you have COPD, even if you uh, stop smoking for, e for at least a year, your EVs are right in line with current smokers when it comes to their pathogenicity. Um, so really diving into the differences between patients in this, what's, what, what's keeping some of these patients from developing COPD, or are they destined to down the road? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can also see as it, as it decreases the non-CBD patients who former smokers, it decreases, but never quite gets back to baseline. Um, all of these samples, we're going to be able to look at longitudinally. Um, so patients that have done, and then three years down the road to see if there is any change in the pathogenicity of these EVs from their, um, from their bout. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll end, and I've got time for plenty of questions. So if, if any of you guys have any. I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. So. 
I know that was beefy, but uh, I appreciate your attention. <laughs> yes. How did you distinguish apoptotic bodies from EVs in your studies? Because different things have short lifespan and terms of the market, yep. C91 and P9, they are expressed even on apoptotic bodies. Right. So the the only way that we was we did two ways. We did size is is was the main way. So most apoptotic bodies, when you spin out for the exit of the vesicles, will spin out at the 10,000 G spin. They won't come out at the 150,000 G spin. Um, but we can't say for sure that we don't also have apoptotic bodies in our sample. However, the size distribution that we have, and it is so much smaller than what you would expect apoptotic bodies to be, that we that is our that's why we call them EVs, and we don't consider them to be specifically just exosomes. But we can't say for sure that we don't have those at all within our population. Yeah. Yes. First of all, two questions. Um, one is so presumably then the one, one potential reason for the for the patients who stop smoking but still have quite high burden in these exosomes is this got to do with the stability and the lack of turnover of these exosomes from the airway compartment? Um, or is it because of the antitrypsin level and that's staying higher? In the Lower. That's a really good question, and one that I'm excited to eventually answer or even answer part of. I think there's a lot more going on, especially with crosstalk with some epithelial cells and things that are occurring in the lung. Um, I think that there's changes in signals, that there's going to be some sort of basal level of um, inflammation that may still occur. That's going to, because you got to keep these EVs are going to go away. They're not going to stay there forever, but something has to keep propagating and potentiating their, their development. Um, looking at, so when you look at a COPD phenotype, there's COPD in itself is really aligned with senescence in a lot of the cells that are in the lung. There are now indicators that microRNAs within extracellular vesicles can signal senescence to occur in cells. I think that we may be seeing that there's a big coordinated effort from multiple areas that causes that tip over point. But my second question is, is there any evidence um, that some of this can spill over into the circulation? And, and, and the reason why I ask that is, you know, a lot of data out there on environmental toxins that cause airway inflammation that then increases the susceptibility to mm -hmm. body of Africa. I would say without knowing, my guess would be yes, um, because you can see increased PGP in circulation. And if you have PGP in circulation, you're gonna stimulate neutrophils. Those neutrophils are gonna release, the granulate release. The only thing I don't know is in circulation, when a neutrophil, if a neutrophil degranulates in circulation, just due to the, the sheer force of the, the motion, how much of this neutrophil elastase is gonna be within a region to bind to the EV? I don't know that. But I do think it's systemic, and I don't think it's limited just to the lung when these things happen. Yeah. Yes. I have um, a very nice work, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and one kind of comment and one question. The comment is, as you know, uh, neutrophils release a lot of stuff, and uh, a lot of these proteases, not just neutrophil acids, are ca highly cationic, right? So mm -hmm. they can bind any negatively charged surface, for example, on the extensor of glucose. So it, it's going to be difficult to distinguish uh, the action of specifically neutrophil elastase versus things like proteinase 3, uh, uh, metal proteinases, but also right. myeloperoxidase. Mm -hmm. From other, some other systems, we know that neutrophil elastase can actually work in accord with other, uh, uh, together with other enzymes that should be always based with uh, an answer. Right. So I was actually, so there was my question in MBN, and you basically in the data that there's probably something called immutable acids. Yeah, yeah. Maybe so we know that matrix metalloproteins 12 from macrophages do contribute a lot in the smoking model. We've actually seen that. We, we looked at that. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always wanted to look at some of the other um, prote proteases that are released by neutrophils, just like you said, like the uh, like myeloperoxidases and the, and the uh, protease 3. Um, but we've looked at them on the surface and... In my, I, I don't know if it could be an antibody thing, but I see a much higher surface response with neutrophil elastase than I do with those other, not to say that they don't have any role, uh, uh, but I see more neutrophil elastase on the surface than I do for, I don't even think I've detected proteins three or myeloperox. I may have detected myeloperoxidase 
on the surface, but this was a while back. And yeah. so the question is, so how do you activate your glucose? We use a formal methionine leucine phenylalanine, FMET Luffy, a small dose of FMET Luffy um, to cause them to, to degranulate without going all the way to netosis so that we don't have right. to deal with the netosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it was recommended. If there's actually maybe a netosis involved because uh, small pieces of nets would also bind to the exosomes. Yes. So if and there, we have done that accidentally where we let it go too long or someone in the lab put too much f Luffy accidentally, their calculations are wrong and we'll get netosis. When that happens, a lot of the EVs will just stick to the nets and you, you don't recover them. So you end up getting a much lower yield in your um, EV recovery because those nets and the EVs will uh, centrifuge out at a much lower, usually at the 10,000 G spin, they're gone. Because all that the DNA comes in. Uh, Say again? The, the small pieces of nets might be actually- Oh, well, that's true. They, active, they, yeah, they may be. Um, right. I don't know if they would, that'd be interesting. I'd like to see if they would centrifuge out at 150,000 G, I should, I should test that. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely try and look out for netosis because that, that really gums up our view. So use DNA swam to just cut it up and see if you lose any of the activity. We could. I, I, I worry about if, it, it, the only thing I was worried about adding extraneous things is how do they interact with the, with the exosome themselves, um, just because they're so small for the EV. Um, but it would be worth doing, just add some DNA, just to make the changes, um, some of that, uh, that, that yield. Um, yeah, that's good. That's a good. Good point. Good question. Yes. So, uh, what are you thinking in terms of you going forward with the protamine sulfate? I mean, that that would be a you'd have to consistently treat with that to see a. Uh, I can. I can back against the long term effect. So, if I can minimize this, I've got this. I got some of this data. This is well, long term effect. Yes, but we do know it works. Um, when we incubate EVs with protamine sulfate and then give them to mice, it, they lose their protective. The, the EV does not have any activity. And, and this is sort of, this graph is here. It just shows like this is EVs pre-incubated with protamine sulfate. It's very similar to the effects of PBS. So it, it does protect it. However, given as a therapeutic, it's already FDA approved for certain regions. I know that, but if you give it too, too high, it's gonna be, it's dangerous. So that would definitely be something that has to be worked out down the road. And I would imagine if you can show that you do get some response, protective response, even in a, you know, give it every day or once a week or, you know, time it out, titrate it, then it may be worth examining even further. But um, I, you would have to, you would have to give it along with, at least at some interval, regular interval. Yeah, because as long as you have the neutrophils there, yeah. you're going to be replenishing the, the exosomes, right? Right. Um, and, and that's the thing, that's another interesting thing with what we want to look at these longitudinal studies is, especially with these former smokers, and you, if we begin to see this biphasic sort of situation where some of these are destined to continue, is that capable of being saved somehow? Is there, a, is there a turning point that you can revert it back and sort of minimize that progression? And is that, is protein, like, if you could stop the whole process long enough, would it revert back to almost a, a steady state? Mm -hmm. Don't know. So what you need is a competitive inhibitor that doesn't have any long-term toxicity effects on the patient, right? You mean for neutrophil elastase? Yeah, yeah, to, to, yeah to, to release it from the exosome. You mean to, to, to prevent the NE from getting to the EV? Well, you, you, I think the protamine sulfate is, the idea is that it is going to release the neutrophil elastase from the exosome, right? Yeah, so that alpha-1 so antitrypsin. That would then, then leave the lung eventually, probably pretty quickly. Right, right. So what you really need is an inhibitor that doesn't have some of the negative properties that the negative being not good properties. Right. Like protamine sulfate. Right. We are, protamine sulfate isn't the only ionic sort of thing we're looking at as well. There are some that are smaller that have less of the negative side effects and issues that protamine sulfate would have. We're looking into those as well. But anything that would cause an arrest of this phenotype and potentially if we could observe sort of a regression back to normalcy would be worth investigating. Yeah. I mean, currently we're still looking at anything that is in these EVs that can propagate this uh, disease phenotype and how can we manipulate and modify that currently. Um, we thought in this, in this graph, just interestingly, uh, 
The uh, MP9, which is something that's right in here, I didn't go over this, but that's a, an inhibitor to prevent the EVs from binding to extracellular matrix. In vivo, it doesn't really do anything because binding to extracellular matrix isn't as important as preventing the enzymatic activity. Yeah. So that was one. Yeah. Yes. Going back to the patient with the COPD, any blood counts, any effect? I mean, blood neutrophil count has any bearing on it? Um, I don't have the, I have to go back and look at the blood neutrophil counts for any of those patients. Um, we, uh, the only thing that I had doing that was the bronchovial and Bosch fluids themselves. Um, and those were all cell-free. So um, I would imagine that different, yeah. I mean, there that's probably a contributor to <clears throat> some of these effects is how many neutrophils are they having? Are they going through an exacerbation event at the time? Like what is happening at that moment when that valve is being uh, taken? Um, but we still see, I mean, all of every COPD patient that we've ever looked at has had those EVs that were proteolytic. And if, even if they have stopped smoking, they are still so far above the norm. So I just, I don't know if there's a neutrophil exhaustion. I don't know if we get low. I have no idea. We haven't looked at that. That's what our longitudinal study actually is going to help us look at is we get these patients and we get all their data. We get the same patients three years later, look at what's changed and how their EVs are, are, are reacting. So that would be, that would be very useful for this because these are all snapshots in time. Like it's just one snapshot. Yes. Very stupid question. Uh -huh. You show the pulmonary function test, respiratory function test in a mouse model? Yeah. How do you do like FEV 1.0? How do you do that? There's a machine called the Flex Event. Yeah, and they, they measure. Yep. Yeah, it does all the measurements for it. Does, I, I am not good at it. Uh, I can tell you that right now. People are much smarter than me and much better at that machine than I am. I don't do well with tiny things like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's they hook it up to the Flex Event. It's forced air volume. It's Everything's kept at a at the constant pressure and you measure the the resistance, you measure the elastic, the elastic, all, all of it, the, the compliance. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Looks like we're almost at the end of the hour. So unless there's one last question, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Gibson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.